Let us now take a look at virtual memory management. We discussed a bit of virtual memory management before in our introduction to computer architecture. So let's now take some detailed look at how stuff like this works in Linux. So usually Linux requires a memory management unit to be present as part of your computer hardware, though there are certain versions called UC Linux that were modified to live without a memory management unit, but then also without memory protection. So if we have a memory management unit, this memory management unit translates the virtual addresses that are generated by your program's code, so by your processor, to physical addresses that are used to access the main memory your RAM. So as we've already seen, this creates the illusion that every process has the complete address space for its own use. And in addition to doing this remapping of virtual addresses to physical addresses, we can also have protection because while we are doing this translation process from a virtual to a physical address, we can also check for additional meta information. We can check for permission bits that indicate how this region of RAM or ROM or whatever physical memory that's behind this virtual address may be accessed. So for some regions, you may only want to permit read permissions, for others you might also want to permit writes, and for even yet another group you might even want to permit access to uh, this memory region for executing code. And of course there might be some memory regions which are completely inaccessible to a certain process. So we can protect pages. Uh, so this is an efficiency measure because uh, if we wanted to protect every single address like every byte or every word in our memory, the uh, administrative information required to actually keep uh, track of whatever accesses are allowed and are not allowed would actually take more space in memory than the memory contents themselves. So that's why we're only checking the permissions and also doing the translations on a certain granularity. And this granularity is usually called a page. So what we do is we split up our address uh, space in virtual memory as well as physical memory into units of the same size. For example, this can be four kilobytes, but they're also larger and sometimes even smaller page sizes in use. And what the translation process then does, it translates all addresses inside of a virtual memory page to a so-called page frame in physical memory that has the same size. So essentially the most significant bits are translated wherever the least significant bits, in this case, the least significant 12 bits for 4K page size, uh, remain untranslated and are just passed unchanged. In order to enable this address translation, the MMU uses so-called page tables. So page tables are tables in RAM. And for each mem memory page that actually has a valid mapping, the page table contains the address of the related physical page frame, which has, as we've seen, the identical size. So each process has its own page table, which is kept in memory. And in order to keep the size of the page table small, because very few processes really make use of the whole four gigabytes of address space on a 32-bit system, for example, we use a sparse mapping. So we only map pages that are actually present in physical memory. Uh, and this means for all the other pages, we don't need to provide an entry. Page table entries also contain this information on access permissions, so like read and write and many more. So here you can see the structure of a typical page table entry for an x86 32-bit machine. So in the most significant 20 bits, it contains the page base address. So essentially the physical address that is part of yeah, the uh, translation process for a virtual address. So the physical address that is actually emitted by the MMU to the RAM whenever the uh, corresponding virtual address is uh, indicated by the CPU. And then we have some other information like uh, if this page is actually present, there's a bit, if it's read or write, uh, if it's a page accessible for user mode programs or only for supervisor programs, and then some additional bits that uh, indicate caching. And we also have bits that indicate if this page has actually been accessed since the last time this bit has been reset. And if this page has been written to, so if a page has been written to in memory management terms, this is called a dirty page. 
So uh, what you may miss here is a bit indicating an execute permission. So in fact, 32-bit x86 CPUs like the one shown here do not provide a bit indicating execute permissions. So this means executing code is always permitted, which is a significant security problem. So this was changed in the 64-bit versions of x86 and of course in all other contemporary processors. So this is what a structure of this page table looks like. So as I've said, the page table is a data structure which is stored in RAM and only small excerpts of the page tables are shared, uh, are cached in a so-called translation lookaside buffer. So this is a, spe a special kind of cache for just uh, keeping information on most recently used, for example, uh, virtual memory page table entries. So whenever we have a linear address that's generated by our CPU, so our program, for example, reads or writes a memory location, this address is split into three parts. So we've seen the least significant 12 bits here, the offset, are just the offset inside of a four kilobyte page. So you need 12 bits to address four kilobytes. So this is passed unchanged to the physical RAM. But the other two parts here, the most significant 20 bits, are actually translated. And they're not translated as a whole, but they're translated in two pieces of 10 bits each. So the most significant 10 bits from 22 to 31 actually give us an index to the page directory. So 10 bits means we can uh, address 1024 entries. Each entry, as we've seen, has four bytes each. So a page directory is another four kilobyte page. And uh, well, uh, from this directory entry, then we can link to one of several page tables here. And for this specific page table now that is addressed by this directory entry in the most significant 10 bits, then the next 10 bits in our linear address from 12 to 21 indicate the index of the entry in that page table here. So this gives us a page table entry, again, 1024 entries, a four kilobyte page. And this page table entry, as we've seen, contains a 20 bit physical address, which is the physical address of a four kilobyte page. So it's the most significant 20 bits. And this is combined with the least significant 12 bits to form a 32 bit physical address. Now, one question that has to be solved is where is this page table actually located in memory? And so we need to indicate the root of our page table. So where in memory our page directory is actually located. This obviously has to be a physical address, so a RAM address, because otherwise we'd have a chicken and egg problem of having to translate a virtual address where it's not known where to find the translation entries. So this physical address of the page actually containing our page directory, so our top, top level for our page table entries is uh, contained in a special CPU register and on x86 CPUs, this is called CR3, so configuration register three, or this is also called PDBR. So Intel likes to have stupid acronyms. So PDBR is just uh, the page directory base register. And this contains the 32-bit address of the page directory actually, but it has to be aligned to a four kilobyte boundary in order to make it easier for the CPU to access the uh, page directory. So how do we use this virtual address translation? So let's again uh, take a look at the structure of the virtual address space for a 32-bit machine because it makes things quite a bit easier. So our machine can run in general in two different modes. So there's a kernel mode, which is used obviously to run the kernel. So whatever is privileged in our operating system. And there is a user mode, which is a restricted mode that well, restricts the execution of certain instructions, like for example, as we've seen, enabling, disabling interrupts. And this user mode is what all of your applications run in. And uh, for efficiency reasons, in most operating systems, the kernel address space is mapped into the address space of each and every user process. So usually there needs to be a split at a sensible location here. And uh, Linux does a split at the three gigabyte limit. So this means a user mode program actually has access to three gigabytes of RAM uh, or to three gigabytes of virtual addresses, in fact. And uh, anything above that is not accessible. So the upper one gigabyte is not accessible when your application is running in user mode. Now, uh, why does this uh, make sense? Well, 
the uh, thing is that we have this TLB, this translation lubricide buffer, and this translation lubricide buffer uh, needs to be flushed when we switch from one process to another, because the new process we are switching to contains another virtual memory setup, so it uses different physical pages, so it needs its own page table. Now, if we would have the four gigabyte of user mode space all for the application, this would mean we would always need to find space for a kernel to execute to. So when we switch to the kernel, because for example, we're performing a system call, then we would need to reload the TLB and the page tables and everything in order to map in executable code and data for our kernel. This takes quite a long time. So uh, in order to reduce these latencies, uh, we're using this trick of having the kernel mapped into the upper one gigabyte. So the kernel actually has a gigabyte of virtual addresses for its own. And this is the same mapping in all user processes. So this means the upper one gigabyte, this mapping doesn't change. Accordingly, we don't have to reload this amount of the page table entries into the TLB if they're mapped. And this means that our switch can go faster because we don't need to switch any TLBs around when we're calling from user mode space to kernel space. Now, of course, user mode needs to be restricted, so it's not allowed for user mode code to access kernel space. This is done by using appropriate permission bits on the page table entries for the user mode process page table. But as soon as we're in kernel space, the kernel needs access to user space. For example, if we pass a string to print using a printf, which uses internally the write system call on Unix, this string is obviously located somewhere in user mode spa uh, space. So somewhere in the data segment, for example, of our user mode program. So in order to be able to print it, the kernel needs to access these addresses here in this user mode address space in order to read it and print it on your screen or on your printer. So that makes it easier because the kernel has access to all of the four gigabytes, so to its own one gigabyte, and in addition to these three gigabytes below. But the other way around, when the user mode is running, we're only restricted to these three gigabytes unless we switch to the kernel and execute trusted kernel code. So early Windows versions did a different split, so they split the kernel and user mode address space 50-50. So we had user mode space of two gigabytes and the kernel space also of two gigabytes. Well, that also works, but that leaves less space for your user mode programs. So, uh, well, developers start complaining and your kernel doesn't actually need two gigabytes of virtual address space. So uh, you can actually boot uh, Windows with a slash three GB switch, which changes this split around to be, yeah, very similar to what Linux does. So a three gigabyte, one gigabyte switch. But since your applications need to, uh, yeah, be aware of this, uh, you need to flag your application, your EXA files here, as aware, being aware of these large addresses. Otherwise, they would have problems accessing memory above two gigabytes, so the third gigabyte in our memory space. Now, this is a bit of an old representation. Things have changed quite a bit due to the side channel attacks, Meltdown and Spectrum, you might have heard of, uh, which uh, were detected like uh, almost three years ago by researchers in, in Austria and Germany. And uh, these uh, provide uh, yeah, effects using timing anomalies of the processor and the caches to actually, uh, that actually try to read memory from kernel space uh, when you're running or executing code in user space. So this might try to read page tables of different processes or secret strings, passwords, whatever you're not allowed to read. This is a hardware defect in Intel, AMD, and several other processors. Uh, and in order to actually remove this uh, possibility of accessing this, what has been done is mostly that the kernel address space is now removed from the user mode address space. So we need a more costly transition now from a user mode space to a separate kernel space. If an address is not mapped at all, it cannot be accessed, no matter the access permissions. So uh, essentially mitigating for meltdown and spectra attacks now makes computers actually slower. So we've already seen that every process has its own page table and it's the kernel's responsibility to switch between the different processes when it switches between different processes. And as I already said on the previous slide, the same kernel address space, so the upper gigabyte on 32-bit x86 machines on Linux is always mapped 
unless you have these spectral and lifetime mitigations into all process address spaces. All right. So let's look at process memory layouts. So what happens when we transition from a program, so something that's just a couple of bytes on your disk, to a process. So these couple of bytes loaded into memory and well, enriched with runtime state, so a program counter, register contents, a stack context, and so on. We know a process is a program in execution, so a process provides all the information about the runtime context of a program. So when you load the program into RAM, uh, the operating system needs to assign virtual addresses for all of our program sections. We've seen the text and data section and BSS and so on. And we need uh, to reserve virtual memory spaces for additional memory areas. One uh, we've already seen, the so-called stack, which grows from the top of our virtual address space towards the bottom. And there's another address space for dynamically allocated memory. So all memory you're not directly accessing using yeah, programming language defined variables, which are automatically allocated. So this additional memory, which you can allocate on Unix using a function called malloc, is the so-called heap. And this heap is just yeah, a collection of, well, data regions, memory regions of different size. And you access these regions on the heap using a pointer that's returned by malloc. As we've seen, the address space above the 3 gigabyte or the hexadecimal address C seven zeros is not read, write, or executable by the process because there's, that's where our kernel virtual memory address re space resides. So let's take a look at how the sections of our ELF file are actually mapped to virtual memory when a program is loaded. So uh, the sections contained in the ELF file are actually located at the lowest uh, available memory addresses. For some historic reasons, like compatibility with uh, old Unix versions, this doesn't start at virtual address 0, but it starts at an address uh, which is 804.8000 in 32-bit Intel x86 Linux. And here we have the segments we've already seen. So we start with our program code in our text segment. Afterwards, we have our data segment here, so our initialized variables. And right after our data segment comes the BSS segment. Now above the BSS segment, we have our heap, which grows dynamically towards larger addresses. And well, the first, uh, the topmost gigabyte is used by the kernel, as we've seen. So below this topmost gigabyte, the virtual addresses for the stack start and grow downwards. And in between, we also have meta information from the ELF file containing memory management information, file mapping, uh, the C library, and so on. So stuff that we would need, for example, for mapping shared libraries. And you have additional uh, information provided to your program by the linker, uh, which is some uh, meta variables here. So for example, you can find a variable end code uh, indicating the end address, virtual address of your text segment, the starting virtual address of your data segment and the ending one, and also for your heap. So this is traditionally called the break segment or BRK. So you have a start of break and end of break. And these are variables you could actually read out from your program if you want to figure out more about the memory layout of your program. So you can define the memory layout of your program by hand. So uh, this is done using the linker and the linker can be configured as we've already seen using a linker script. So the linker script can be used to define address space regions for ELF sections and additional information like the entry point. So which address should the OS jump to after it has uh, executed or performed the XX system call. The order of segments in memory can be changed, the alignment and so on. So this very simple linker script here just defines uh, information for our sections here. So here we would start with our current address, which is just indicated by the dot here at hexadecimal one five zeros here. And at that address, we want to locate everything that's related to our text segment here. And then our next address, we'll switch to eight and the number of zeros here. So we start at another virtual address. And at that address, we first place our data segment. And directly after that, we'll place our BSS segment. So you can define the memory process layout using this linker script. So how do we do it? Well, we uh, use a linker script as we've seen before, and then we can actually compile our C source code file. So let's take this example foo.c here. 
uh, which has, as you've seen, a constant uh, integer variable here, a regular initialized integer variable, and an uninitialized integer variable and a function main, just doing a bit uh, of arithmetics on these variables. So we compile it to an object file foo.o. Using this invocation GCC, we tell our compiler we want 32-bit codes. We want to have it compile only down to an object file, so not do the linking. And so we get foo.o as a result, and now we can link foo.o manually by executing our linker ld, uh, telling the linker we want a 32-bit Intel ELF binary. And we also tell our linker, please use our linker script using the dash capital T option here. So this linker script we've just uh, seen before. We want our output ELF file, executable file, to be named foo. And this was read to the next line here in the example. Uh, we want uh, only to link our object file foo.o. And so when we call nm on our foo file to get the symbols, we see we have a variable a, which is a read-only variable here, so const, which is located at that address here. So we didn't specify anything for our data here. Then we have our initialized variable b. This is at exactly the address where the data segment starts. So we see it here. And then we've set directly after the data segment, the BSS segment follows, since our data segment only contains our variable b here. Well, we can immediately start the BSS segment after finding four bytes for B. So just four bytes after B, we have our C in memory. And then finally, we've set one for zeros is the start address of our text segment. So our first and only function in our text segment main starts at that address here. All right. So the thing we were wondering about was why on earth is our variable a, that is a constant. Why was this not located somewhere in a data segment? That was the what the hell, yeah. Uh, and this is because we didn't define any section.ro data for read-only data in the linker script. So that was automatically allocated by the linker to just lie after the text segment here. So if we want to provide a specific space for our RO data, we have to add a line to our linker script, just telling our linker that it should also place RO data at address eight, seven zeros. And after our RO data, now we have data. And after that, we have BSS. So if we compile and link it again using our modified linker script here and do our NM, well, we see, yes, there's four bytes for A as RO data at eight number of zeros. Then after that, now we have our data segment at address plus four and at address plus eight, we have our BSS segment. So we only have one four byte variable in each segment and main remains at the address we've specified in our linker script. As I've said, linker scripts can do so much more. So they can reorder object files, they can do address arithmetics, they can do alignment, they can split for embedded systems between uh, things that uh, don't need to be modified. So they can end up in a ROM or flash and things that have to be modified. So like uh, data that has to be stored in RAM and so on. So uh, there's a whole lot of literature about this. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. Usually as a programmer writing application programs, you don't need to concern yourself too much with linker scripts because the standard linking usually should work for you. But if you have special use cases or special applications, I think it's a good idea that you've at least seen a bit how such a linker script actually works. So to be completely sure, we can of course also check the layout of our executable again using the read elf program. And we've seen there are several load segments here. So one is read and uh, executable here with an alignment of four kilobytes, so hexadecimal 1000, and it's at virtual address one and four zeros here. And then we have another load address, which just contains all the rest here. So this is at address eight, a number of zeros, and uh, this takes up eight bytes of memory. So why does it take eight and not 12? Well, because we only provide the information for the read-only data, so the initialized variable here, uh, our const variable, and for data in the ELF file, whereas BSS is still zero initialized, so we don't have to provide it. So we only store these four bytes and the other four bytes, but not the remaining four bytes here. And finally, we have a stack segment here. This doesn't have a virtual address assigned here because that's the task of the operating system. And if we look at the section to segment mapping, 
we see that these sections of our ALF file uh, that are in a contiguous memory region, so RO data and data in BSS, are actually merged together in this ALF segment 1 that we see here, whereas text, which is in a different address range, is put in its own yeah, segment of our ALF file, uh, which is the first one up here. So when discussing uh, the uh, execution of programs, we've already seen that programs usually are not running standalone. This is possible, so you can actually write a program which only uses uh, system call instructions, no external libraries and so on. But usually that doesn't make sense. It requires a lot of work. And of course, you, as a programmer, you want to increase your productivity to reuse uh, existing code in libraries and stuff. So libraries on Unix contain useful functionality, like we've seen the libc with C standard functions, like printf, for example, libm with mathematical functions, so for example, a sine or cosine function, or libx11 that provides x11 Windows system functions. And uh, man, since many programs use the same libraries, so all standard C programs, for example, use libc, which is quite a big library on a traditional Unix system nowadays, uh, when you would use static linking, you would add a copy of each of these libraries to ex every executable file. Uh, this is a waste of disk space, obviously, because you'd have lots and lots of copies of that C library lying around. And these are also allocated in memory for each process, so you'd waste RAM. In addition, it causes one more problem. For example, if you found a security problem in your libc on a system using static libraries, so linking the libc explicitly to each executable program, that would mean you would need to relink uh, all of your executable programs. That takes a lot of work. Whereas on a system that uses shared libraries, so libraries that are only contained once on disk and are loaded on demand when a program is started, then you only need to update this shared library and potentially reboot your machine. There's ways around this, to be honest, uh, in order to well, probably fix the security problem and it's then automatically fixed in every of the programs that use this version of your shared library. So a shared library is a separate ALF file that usually uh, doesn't contain any main function. And uh, if we have an ALF file that has unresolved functions or symbols, so in its text segment, for example, it tries to access a function that's not part of the ALF file, that is uh, your executable program or tries to access a variable that's not part of the ALF file. These functions and symbols can be resolved using shared libraries. So we indicate when linking a program with shared libraries, the linker should consider because the linker needs to ensure the program is still consistent. Even if it doesn't add the shared libraries to our program, it still needs to check against all the shared libraries if all the symbols we use are actually defined. And uh, this name resolution is costly, so shared libraries usually use hash tables for this because there can be several thousand or even tens of thousands of names defined in such a system using shared libraries. So how can we find out which shared libraries are actually used or referenced by an ALF file? So let's try to compile an example program again. And uh, we compile our program like we've seen before, just uh, now generating an executable file foo. So this is using GCC as our linker here. You've seen GCC is only a front end for the several stages of our compiler. So if we tell GCC to use the dash O option and just pass it an object file, GCC actually does the linking for us and provides an executable file called foo. Now there's an additional command, which is a bit confusingly called LDD. So you've seen the norm normal static linker is called LD. And uh, the dynamic linker, which is part of the operating system, that actually provides this functionality to automatically load these shared libraries when we start a program, this is called LDD. So don't mix up those two because they're both linkers, but they have different functionality. So LDD actually is a tool that is a support tool for the dynamic linker and LDD, you can uh, try to remember it as list dynamic dependencies. So LDD takes an executable ELF file and prints the lists of referent, uh, reference shared libraries inside of this. And there we see uh, one thing we've already known, libc is our C library, .so stands for shared object and dot six is a version number. So inside of the ELF library, this is actually just named as a file name. And then 
using uh, certain configurations like uh, environment variables, uh, our operating system tries to find this file in a, a number of given directories on our disk. And here it tells us, so LDD tells us, okay, uh, this library libc.so.6 can be found in our directory lib32, and then this file name here. Now uh, we have additional things, uh, the dynamic linker itself, is part of the executable. So the dynamic linker itself is actually dynamically loaded to the program at start and then takes care of loading the other shared libraries. That's a bit of, yeah, more or less magic going on there. And uh, then we have something else, so-called Linux gate of SO.1. We'll see in a bit what this is used for. And after the file names and resolutions here, it also prints the addresses. So we see uh, that these addresses are somewhere on top of the process address space, so at OXB 77 something, and uh, well, uh, larger addresses here. So uh, they're almost at this three gigabyte limit here. So LDSO searches and loads the shared libraries required by the program when the program is started. Then it prepares the program for execution, and finally, it starts our program. So we've seen this mysterious Linux gate as 0.1, and we've seen, uh, well, there's no file name for it. So this is really not something you need to know by heart. This is only for the sake of completeness. And if you look and search through your file system, you will never find a file Linux gate as 0.1. This is uh, another trick Linux uses to be a bit more efficient. So this is a so-called virtual shared library. So this is just a piece of executable code that's held in memory and provided by the kernel. And this is mapped into process address spaces by the kernel. And this actually provides portable mechanisms for system calls. So this especially uh, realizes the functionality that allows you to, well, run a compiled Linux binary on different Linux kernel versions, for example, or on different distributions, of course, uh, still on the same CPU architecture you compiled it for. So here we have additional portable mechanisms to optimize the system so it can be more flexible. If you're interested in this, there's more details at that URL. I don't want to go into more details on that because that gets quite hairy, to be honest. So if you want to figure out the memory layout of a process you've uh, compiled and started, you can do this at runtime and your Linux system actually supports you because Linux uh, supplies a number of meta information uh, pieces in a so-called virtual file system, which is called PROC for processes. And this contains, for example, kernel information on the system and process state. So you can look at PROC mem info to take a look at the general memory layout of your system. You can take a look at PROC uptime. So these are just files or file names. They're not files on the disk. They're just virtual files provided by the kernel, but they behave like regular files. Or you could check your kernel version by looking at PROC version, for example, using cat something. And for each running process, you have a separate subdirectory, which is just named after the process ID of the running process. So one, two, three, four or something. So in slash proc slash one, two, three, four, you find a number of additional uh, information, meta files here, virtual files provided by the kernel for each process. So you can, for example, check the command line that was used to execute or start your process. You can look at scheduling statistics. You can look at the current stack context. So you can figure out the call hierarchy when where is your program actually currently executing. And in proc, then the pit of your process and maps, you can look at the allocation of virtual memory that is currently valid inside of your process. So in order to do this, uh, well, you first need to retrieve the process ID of a running process. Let's say we have a process foo that's running in the background. So we can use our process status tool, giving it the information we want uh, all information to be printed and we grab for foo. And then we find a process ID on uh, 10,323, for example. Since this is dynamically allocated when the process is started, you will probably get a different number when you try it. So uh, what we need to know is the process we want to look at, foo, has the pit of 10,323. And so we can look at the virtual memory mappings inside of proc process ID and then the maps file. And we see a lot of addresses here. And we might recognize this address again. This is a starting address of our text segment for foo. So we see here we have one page, four kilobytes, which is part of foo. And we have another page, another four kilobytes, 
which is also foo. And then higher up, we see in this address space B7 something, we have our libc mapped. Actually, libc is a bit bigger, so this takes a number uh, of additional pages here. Uh, down here we have something that's just called VDSO, which stands for Virtual Dynamic Shared Object. This is part of your Linux gate SO. And finally, you have the dynamic loader, which was loaded into the process address space at these addresses here. And on top of our uh, dynamic loader, we have an address space that grows downward from here to here, reserved to the stack. And you can also see the access permissions. So for example, our stack is readable and writable, obviously, but you're not allowed to execute code on the stack. Whereas, for example, we have a code segment here that's readable and executable, and maybe we have some sort of data segment here that's readable and writable. All right, so Linux provides you with lots of information about this, and you can use this to debug your programs, or you can use this, use this if, if you're just interested to take a closer look what's actually going on inside of your Linux system. So here, again, we just show a mapping of the sortened and shortened output of our proc file for the memory layout. And we see, of course, this relates, if we reorder it a bit, to the graphics we've seen before. So we start with our text segment here. We have our data segment up here. Then we have our libc in this memory mapping segment, also the VDSO, so our uh, Linux gate uh, stuff and our dynamic linker here in that memory region. And finally, on top here, we have our stack mapped. And of course, we don't have any addresses larger than 0xc something because that's where our kernel resides. So these addresses would be illegal uh, for our application to use from user mode. So when our operating system loads our ELF file to memory, well, it first starts loading the text section of the ELF file. So this contains all of our instructions here at this start address. And after that, well, it can also have strings in here, which are part of your text segment. So constant strings are part of the text segment usually. On top of that, you can have your uh, data segment, which contains initialized variables here or pointers or whatever. And then you might have the BSS segment. And as you've seen, this is not part of the ELF file. This is just automatically filled with zeros uh, and as many zeros as actually is indicated in the ELF file as the, uh, the size of the BSS segment. So only the parts here in with a, a reddish background are actually contained in the binary image on disk. And we've just used an example here from a slide set that used a slightly different binary. So that's why we have different variables here. But as we've already seen in our linker script, we also have predefined variables by the linker that allow us to get the uh, get at the memory layout of our program from inside the program, so from inside of our running C program. So for this, we have uh, meta variables. These start with two underline characters, for example, executable start, and another one that's called underline underline e-text. So these are part of uh, essentially uh, things that are linked to it. So they're not variables here. So they're declared as extern. And uh, well, to get this, uh, we uh, can actually print the address of that. So for example, we can print the address of executable start. Here we did it using percent %lx because that's a bit older example code. You should actually usually do it using the percent %p operator, which means you can leave out this stupid typecast here. That would be a bit of a cleaner code. So you can print the executable start address and you can also print the e-text, which is the end of your text section. And if you compile it and run it, so this is a shortcut on the shell. So first you compile it using this command line here to an executable called e-text. And this and and operator on the shell indicates that if that one here was successful, then it executes that one here, which just starts our program. And then we see our start of our executable is at 8048000, as we've seen before. And it takes hexadecimal for a eight bytes because that's the end of our text segment. And so uh, we could look at exactly these set of bytes, hexadecimal for a eight bytes, inside of our process virtual address space, and we would find all the binary encoded machine instructions that are part of our executable code there. So what you could also do is to add an option to your compilation uh, execution here. 
and this option is uh, called using uh, the dash capital WL uh, parameter, which means pass this to our linker here. And then we pass dash dash verbose. And you can try it on your system uh, because running a demo here in the recording usually messes up all the video. Uh, so if you try this, uh, you could actually get like a, a large amount of output, like 250 lines. And that tells us all about which variables are going where, which stuff is mapped where in your final executable. So your linker, if you want it to be, can provide you very many details about the contents of the program it generates on disk.